Good morning, everyone. This is Frank Liu. Welcome back to Finite One to Two One Introduction to Finance Week Eleven Lecture. Today we'll go through our final topic, portfolio theory. Interestingly, as we will see in the rest of the lecture today, portfolio theory is far from being the finale of the show. There's a lot to go through today, and I encourage you to consider reading this week's slides at least three times. We'll go through portfolio construction. Looking at equally weighted versus unequally weighted portfolio, define an efficient frontier, learn how to calculate the Sharpe ratio, re-examine efficient portfolio and risk premium. Towards the end, we'll look at how we can derive capital asset pricing model or CAPM again in the portfolio theory framework. The recommended rating is Chapter Twelve. Similar to last week, our lecture slides cover slightly more concept. Than a textbook. Here are the due dates for the last three MFL tests. I want to start today's lecture slightly differently. I mean, you already saw the first way to derive the CAPM under the no upcharge framework in last week's lecture, so there's nothing mysterious about what the formula looks like and how we can apply the formula if we identify all the elements, the risk-free rate, the beta, and the market risk premium. I want to take you back in history to see all these great minds behind it. You may recall that I mentioned a number of scholars won a Nobel Prize because of this. In 1990, the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel was awarded to three laureates: Harry Markowitz, William Sharp, and Merton Miller. Nobel Prize in Economics is not one of the Nobel Prizes that were endowed by Alfred Nobel in his will. It was established, I think, in 1968 by the donation from Sweden's central bank, Sveriges Riksbank, to the Nobel Foundation to commemorate the bank's 300th anniversary. Although it is technically not a Nobel Prize, but is administered and referred to along with the other Nobel Prizes by the Nobel Foundation, laureates receive the award at the same ceremony. So here we go. Something that you can, something that is better for you to know in one of these quizzes. So in 1990, the prize in economics was awarded to these three economists. According to the Nobel Prize website, it was for their pioneering work in a theory of financial economics. Harry Markowitz is well recognized as the father of modern portfolio theory, something that we'll go through today. William Sharp is known as one of the originators. Of the capital asset pricing model, Merton Miller was best known as the co-authors of the Modigliani-Miller theorem, which forms the basis for modern thinking on capital structure. So, simply put, if in the absence of taxes, bankruptcy cost, and agency cost, in an efficient market, the value of a firm is unaffected by how the firm is financed. So, it doesn't matter whether the firm raises capital through debt or equity.、Uh, like a famous analogy is like. In the absence of tax and everything, and when you let's just say you have a big pizza, and when you feel really hungry, you say, "Okay, rather than cutting to four slices, I'm gonna cut into six slices because I'm hungry." Well, you know, some of you may get a joke because it doesn't really matter how many slices you're gonna cut into; it's the same pie, right? Same, same pizza, and that's the same based on the MM theory, Modigliani and Miller theorem. You will learn more about this in Finite Two 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 Corporate Financial Policy. If you paid attention just then, you may recall that I said William Sharp is known as one of the originators of CAPM. This is because there were three other researchers independently developed this model around the same time. The first fun fact that McCauley was Sharp's unofficial PhD supervisor, and you can clearly see there is a connection between portfolio theory and CAPM. So CAPM was independently developed by four scholars around the same time. More specifically, it was in Sharp's 1964 paper, published in the Journal of Finance, in Jack Trenow's 1961 and 1962's unpublished paper, in Jane Mawson's 1966 paper published in Econometrica, and in John Lindner's 1965 paper published in Review of Economics and Statistics. So I guess you may be asking, why didn't the other three people receive the Nobel Prize? Of course, I was not in the committee, and so I cannot tell you what actually happened in that year. But I'm a researcher, so I will try to recover what happened based on the available information. First of all, 
Since 1974, the Nobel Foundation has stipulated that a prize cannot be awarded posthumously. This probably explains why John Littner and Jane Mawson couldn't have got it. Now let's turn to Jack Trenor. Jack was the prodigy of Franco Modigliani. Not his PhD supervisor, because he never pursued a PhD, but this doesn't change the fact that he had made so many contributions to the research in finance. When Jack was doing his graduate study at Harvard Business School, he was taught to compare discounted cash flows with the initial investment, much the same way as that we have been doing as the MPV analysis in Fina 1221 so far. But Mr. Trainer came to realize that if one needs to discount cash flows in 20 or 30 years time, the present value would be very sensitive to the choice of the discount rate. So this gave him the idea to try to understand the relation between risk and the discount rate, which later went on to become his version of CAPM in his 1961 and 1962 manuscript. In 1960, when Mr. Trainer finished his first draft, he sent it to John Littner at Harvard University. Because Professor Littner was the only economist he knew even slightly, so interestingly, Littner, Littner failed to see the merit of the so and so trainer received no encouragement. Then one of trainer's colleagues helped him send the draft to Murder Miller. It was Miller's co-author Modigliani who saw the shine of it and invited Trainer to do a PhD in economics with him at MIT. Trainer did decide to give it a go at MIT and present a part of his work on CAPM to the MIT faculty members in 1962 and 1963. A few months later after his second presentation, Modigliani told Trainer about William Sharp's CAPM paper, which was essentially the same as what Trainer had in his papers. And so Modigliani suggested Trainer and Sharp to exchange the draft. Why Trainer never, pu never, never pursued publishing those two papers in academic journal remains unanswered. So if you have been careful, you may notice that it was William Sharp's 1964 paper. This is another irony with researching finance. While well, Sharp first submitted his paper to general finance in 1962, however, the paper that would become one of the foundations of financial economics was considered to be irrelevant and rejected. So he had to wait for the journal to get a new editor to resubmit his work to have the paper published in 1964. So although the publication is dated in 1964, it doesn't mean the idea and the working paper version of the paper could not have been around before that. Anyway, this is a very brief history of CAPM. When I was making my slide, I thought, why don't I just go a little bit further and be a, bit, a little bit more expensive here and show you a bit more. So not only Jack Trainer's 1961 and 1962 papers created the CAPM, but they also gave birth to another seminal work. A, 19, a famous 1973 paper published in Journal of Political Economy by Fisher Black and Myron Shells. Just like everyone in finance knows about portfolio theory and CAPM, everyone knows about Black Shell's model. This is a model for the dynamics of financial market containing derivative investment uh, instruments. So you will learn this in the second year derivative unit and something I have great hopes that you will enjoy. It is one of those examples that the model gives you a beautiful and elegant equation and yet so insightful. Black Scholes model is sometimes referred to as Black Scholes Merton model because it was Robert Merton's 1973 paper expanding the mathematical understanding of the options pricing model. So in Black Show's 1973 papers, page one, in the footnote one, it says that the inspiration of this work was provided by Jack Trainer early work on CAPM. In 1997, Myron Shells and Robert Merton were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for this model. So, but unfortunately, Fisher Black passed away in 1995, so um, he couldn't have got it. Just another interesting fact, Black and Scholes paper was also initially rejected by many top economics journals as the editors thought the paper was irrelevant and they had to add in extra analysis in economics context to be later accepted at the Journal of Political Economy, which is one of the top five journals in economics. So when you encounter some challenges in your academic and professional life in the future, 
I hope William Sharp and Black Show's publication process can give you some silver lining that even for Nobel Prize worthy research, they could have ha had hard time proving themselves. Just like the old saying, great things take time. It is worthy to mention that Jack Trainer was Fisher Black's mentor. Now I'm going to introduce a few more economists of whom's work you will not be able to avoid in your finance degree. The first one is Eugene Farmer, who did a PhD under Merton Miller's supervision. Farmer is best known for the um, efficient market hypothesis, which states that the price contains all the information when a market is efficient. In other words, no one can always out, no one can always outperform the market. You will study this in details in your third year unit, Finet 3324 Investment Analysis. Pharma is also show, has also shown that empirically KPM doesn't work. So if you feel like there's something missing with the KPM model, don't worry about it, everyone knows it. But that shouldn't stop us to learn this as the step one. Pharma won a Nobel Prize in Economics in 2013. In that same year, Two other economists shared the Nobel Prize. One of them is Robert Schiller, who basically thinks that the market is not efficient and couldn't disagree more with Eugene Farmer. Schiller did his PhD under the supervision of Franco Modigliani. Just to show you how everyone is connected, Farmer joins, uh, jointly supervised Myron Schell's PhD with Merton Miller. Another great mind that is jointly supervised by Miller and Farmer is Professor Philip Brown, our very own national treasurer at UWA. Professor Brown is known as one of the three funding fathers of the modern accounting research. It is not unreasonable to conjecture that every accounting researcher has read his 1968 paper with Ray Ball. Everyone has. Professor Brown's 1968 paper, published in Journal of Accounting Research, was the first paper that adopted the KPM in an empirical study. And it was the first event study that examines the market's reaction to accounting income numbers. Professor Brown also has a connection to McCorvey's and Sharp. How? They were all, they were all the winners of Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize, which is a highly a prestigious prize that recognizes both academic and practical contributions. All right, let me go to the next slide. The inaugural prize went to McCormick's in, in 2013, then Sharp in 20, uh, 2015, and in 2017 it went to Stephen Ross, who is famous for his arbitrage theory of capital asset pricing model or arbitrage uh, pricing model. And in 2019, it went to Philip Brown and uh, Ray Ball. It is a priceless recognition that shows you how important his work is because so many other researchers on this slide could have won a prize. Hopefully this can reaffirm your choice with your degree at UWA. So what have I got to do with, this, with all this? Well, my weak contribution is that I took that photo of Philip Brown in a business school building. Anyway, I'm hopeful that you are now wanting to learn a bit more about the portfolio theory and capital asset pricing model. All right, let's get started. There's a lot to cover today. So the talk will be divided into two components. The first one is on portfolio theory and then moving on to show you efficient portfolio and CAPM. And there are a lot of learning objectives for you to go through. Make sure that you can you can tick each tick each point when you do the revision, and to see whether you have uh, you know whether you fully understand every single item here. All right. So last week we learned how to calculate expected return and volatility for an individual stock. We learned how to calculate that when we know the distribution, which using a formula to calculate expected value and variance, and then square root of variance is volatility. We also learn how to calculate the mean return and standard deviation when, like, based on the past observations. But that's done in the framework of an individual stock. 
We also show we also show that diversification will reduce risk, but we're not sure how much it will reduce risk. We know diversification can get rid of unsystematic risk or firm specific risk. And now we are looking at portfolios of stocks, and we want to calculate expected return, volatility, and of the portfolio, and then we show how to create an efficient portfolio. So in comparing comparing to week ten. When the campaign was developed intuitively by a no arbitrage argument, so you may recall that when we were saying only the systematic risk should be uh, should be uh, should be rewarded with premium, not the unsystematic risk. That give you an idea of to say you know I want to form a portfolio such that you will get rid of the unsystematic risk. So through that argument, we're saying okay maybe there's something called something called called beta that give me a reward for the systematic risk I'm taking. So we can derive CAPM in that way, but we never learned how to quantify beta. And so, so, so today we're gonna derive CAPM again by the more traditional mean variance portfolio optimization technique. All right. So let's go through how to construct a portfolio, how to calculate portfolio returns. So the first definition we're gonna go through is portfolio weight. Which is the fraction of the total investment in the portfolio held in each individual investment, and given that you, you so the portfolio weight must add up to 100%, just like probability, right? So, um, so the the individual weight x i equals to value of investment i divided by total value of portfolio. So let's just say if x i is say 20%, that means 20% of the weight of your portfolio is allocated. To a certain asset I, but unlike probability, where probability only bounds between zero and one, but portfolio weight can be negative. So how would you interpret a number that is negative? So let's say, let's say if X I is minus ten percent, what do you mean by how can you have a portfolio weight of minus ten percent? That means you currently short on the asset I, which means you currently, for example, if you say I. I have a minus ten percent allocated to BHP shares. That means roughly ten percent of my portfolio weight is allocated to BHP, but I'm not holding holding the stocks. I'm actually borrowing the stocks. So I'm borrowing to buy. So I'm borrowing to sell, and I, later on I have to repay. Have to repay the um, the lender the, the BHP shares. So which means that when you see a negative number, it means you're borrowing. You're shorting. It probably makes more sense to say minus fifty percent allocated on cash. That just just means fifty percent of my portfolio weight is borrowed from another one, such that now I can invest a hundred and fifty percent of my portfolio of my wealth into something else because I fifty percent of them is borrowed, right? We'll, I mean, we'll see an example. So, how do we calculate realized and expected returns for a portfolio? When we observed the individual one, so the realized return on the portfolio RP is the weighted average of the returns on the investment in the portfolio, while the weights corresponding to portfolio returns and where each R1, R2, and Rn is is observed for the individual investment. So, which means that,、um, which it just means is a weighted average for a portfolio, and the expected return of of a portfolio、uh, RP here. Is weighted average of the expected returns of the investment within it. So some of you may have done stats. You know that when you calculate expected value of a of a sum of a pro, of of a sum of product, you can actually move the summation out of the expect, expected expected、uh, sign here. So which means that that just becomes, given that weight is non x i is non, that can be moved out of the expected value bracket. So which means that it just becomes a weighted. A evaluated average of the individual returns. So, if, so if that's not your forte, just focus. Just focus on how to apply this formula. All right. Why don't we look at a numerical example? This is actually quite an important example. Assume your portfolio consists of thirty-seven dollars of stock A and seventy-seven dollars of stock B. Your expected return is eighteen percent for A and twenty-five percent for B. At the end of the period, the actual returns, including dividend reinvestment, remember what we talked about、um, in week、uh, in week ten. We're talking about re dividend reinvestment, such that your your annual return will be just just going to be compounded returns. 
which just makes calculation easier, were 10% for A and 20% for B. So what was the expected return for your portfolio? What was the actual return for your portfolio? And what action is needed to rebalance the portfolio? So let's just go through each point and we talk about what you mean by rebalancing. So given your original investment in A was $30,000 and $70,000, your total portfolio was 30 plus 70, which is $100,000. Portfolio weight was that for A it was 37 divided by 100, 30%. For B it would be 77 divided by 100, 70%. So to calculate expected return, just need to use the formula. Expected return for your portfolio equals to the weight times the expected return for, for A, which is 18%, and B, 25% times 0.7. That's what you have here, given the information. So the, the expected portfolio return will be 22.9%. 22, for the actual returns, you need to work out what was the individual actual return for each stock. And again, using the information provided by the, the, from the question, for A, it was 10% and 20% for B. So what's going on over here is that you can then just calculate it. Again, it's weighted, uh, weighted average. Uh, R equals to 0 0.3 times 10% plus 0 0.7 times 20%, which is 17. We can do a, little, we can do a quick uh, verification. So given A has gone up by 10%, the value of A will be 1 plus 10%, 1.1 1 .1 times $30,000, which is $33,000. For B will be 1.2, because given B has increased by 20%, will be 1.2 times the original amount, 70000 which gives you 84000 So the value of portfolio in, uh, in the next time period would be A plus B equals to $117,000. So you can calculate return in such way, which will be, okay, I've got $70,000 gain divided by the original investment, 100,000, which gives you 17%, right? So, um, so what do you mean by rebalancing? What actions needed to rebalance the portfolio? So rebalancing a portfolio is a common practice done by many funds. Like let's say even even like even uh, retail investors like us would like would do that implicitly. For example, if you have a uh, superannuation fund, when you sign up your superannuation fund, you would say I'm gonna allocate. You, you would do a you would do a rough um, allocation to different type of investment. You would say I will allocate roughly forty percent to bonds, fifty percent to the equity, and ten percent to something else to money market or to, to, to some other type of investment, alternative investment. So that means you would have a portfolio, uh, like portfolio way of 40, 50, 10%. And that will be done, so it's just like this question, that will be done at a start. It's just like you would, if you want to allocate 30% to A, 70% to B, you are done at a start. But after one period, say after one year, each component, each stock, stock A and stock B, are gonna go on a different trajectory. So in this case, A gone up by 10%, B gone up by 20%. So relatively speaking, um, B kind of outperforms A because A the expected return was 18%. So 10% is just half of that. Where B was expected to be performing at 25% more, but then it's only gone up to 20%. But relatively speaking, B outperforms A. So in this case, if you if you're not gonna change your uh, if you're not gonna change your agreement with with your super fund. That the super fund would still gonna think that you're gonna allocate 40% in bond, 50% in equity, 10% in alternative investment, such that they will do a rebalancing, such that after one year, if you if one of your components gone up, say to a different weight, say in this case, uh, your bond has gone up to from 40% to 45%, they will have to sell some of that, such that you will then gonna go down back to 40% to keep the same ratio, right? So in this case, uh, given that the, the weight would be 3070, so 0 0.3 times 117,000 gives you 35,100. Which means in this case, if you want to do rebalancing, the, the value of A should be at 35,100. But do you have that many? No, you don't, because the value of A in your current portfolio is only 33,000. So which means you need to allocate 2100, extra $2,100 to A 
But where are you going to get it at $2,100? Well, you have to get it from B. So which means in this case, you will sell $2,100 of B and then use that money to buy A. Such that once you sell, sell down your holding B, your investment in B, as what we're going to be verifying over here, will be 84,000 minus 2,100 divided by 170,000 gives you 70% exactly. So in this case, if you want to do rebalancing, you want to sell $2,100 of V and buy A. So, you, so which means in a nutshell, the rebalancing would happen when one of them outperformed the other in a, in a relative sense. But I just say in this case, if both A and B, let's say if A expected to go by 18%, B go by 25%, even if the expected return, even if the realized return is the same, which means the the realized return, the actual return for A is 18%, for B is 25% as well, you still have to do rebalancing. Why? Because the, because think about this, they are they have growing at a different a different rate, which means the weight will be slightly different. So you, you may want to think about in what scenario would you not have to rebalance your portfolio? Well, one of the cases is, I think the primary case, the only case would be if they are all growing at the same rate. Let's just say if A has gone up by 10%, B has gone up by 10%, then the relative weight ratio was still going to be 3 to 7. Right. But typically, when rebalancing the portfolio, what you have to do is that you would have to sell the relatively winner, because in this case, B relatively outperforms A, and then you have to buy more losers. So this is one of the, uh, you know, one of the arguments against rebalancing, because at the end of the period, you always have to sell the outperformers and buy the under underperformers, such that you would have to keep the same weight, right? Anyway. As this, this is an important example. Hopefully, I'm not giving you too, ma too many hints. So, we are doing a portfolio construction. It makes sense to start everything with N equals to 2, which means buying two stocks. So, let's start with N equals to 2 and looking at return and risk. So, we're going to examine the returns for North Air, West Air, and Tex Oil in the table below. So, here we have three stocks. They have same average return and volatility. However, the pattern, pattern of the returns differ. So for example, when the airline stocks perform well, the oil stock tended to do poorly. And when airlines did poorly, the oil stock tended to do well, right? But very interestingly, what you, what you saw in COVID-19, what you saw in the last three or four months is that we saw the plunge in the oil price. Did we see did we see a share price increase in the airline industry? No, we did not. We saw the opposite. We saw the airline industry all, also go down, right? So even though this argument when the airline stock performed well, the oil stock tended to do poorly, even this argument hold on a, on a, in the normal market, but with COVID-19, it's something that is totally unexpected that had that is systematic event that that would affect every single segment in, in the market. That's something that we just never expected, right? So consider the portfolio which consists of equal investment, equal means 50%, equal investment in West Air and Tax Oil. The average return of the portfolio is equal to the average return of the two stocks. All right, let's have a look at this, uh, this table and then you can come back to look, examine this slide in your own time. So look at this, look at this table. So we, we are provided with six, yearly, six years of return for North Air, West Air, and Tex Oil. As you can see, when North Air performs well, so is West Air, but when North Air not performing well in 2010, 2011, so do West Air. But on the other hand side, for Tex Oil, 2010 and 2011 is probably one of the better years for them. But so what's interesting about this, 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 uh, this, this choice of numbers is that the average return and volatility is exactly the same for North Air, West Air, and Tex Oil. What we are going to show you here is to say, last week we learned about doing, we know we shouldn't put one, one we, shouldn't, we shouldn't put all the eggs in one basket, and we should put in different basket, and Frank even said, you know, you should sell people one basket such that people have something to buy, and such that you can make money. But, um, so over here, we're trying to show you how, what's the, exactly the more efficient way of construct, of, of putting different basket. 
So let's just say we let's just say we form a portfolio of two stocks. So here we have yes, over here we have two different portfolios. One of them is putting half in North Air, half in West Air. The other one is putting half in West Air and, and the other half in Tax Oil. So which means, for example, for 15% in 20, 2007, how do we get that number? That 15% is just average of 21% plus 9%. And for 3.5% in 27 for the second portfolio, that's just half of 9% plus half of minus 2%. Right? So you can do all that and um, we're not going to focus too much on the, on the calculation here, but I just say I, I presume you understand how to calculate that. And the average return, not surprisingly, the average return for two stock portfolios are the same, 10% and 10%. But what is interesting is about is their volatility. One of them is 12.1% and one is 5.1%. So you may recall that we were saying volatility is a good measure for total risk. Um, when it comes to portfolio. So we're, we're not getting there yet because this is just a small portfolio with the only two stocks. But you can, you can kind of see that here, looks like given that there are two ways to construct this portfolio, which one would you prefer? I probably would say I prefer the second portfolio because it gives me the same return, same average return as the first one, but give me less volatility, which means it gives me less dispersion around me less risk right roughly we're gonna go to we're gonna we're gonna get to that point mm -hmm. combining risk so by combining stocks into a portfolio we reduce risk through diversification the amount of risk that is eliminated in a portfolio depends on the degree to which the stocks face common risks and their prices moving together so some of you may have done the um, MFL test 10 I remember the last question is on uh, independent risk and common risk if, not, if you're not sure how to answer that question, there's a discussion thread in MFL, uh, in the discussion forum or three for MFL test. Right, feel free to go, go read over there. So here we can see that combining the two airlines which face common risk, because if something happened to the airline industry, you'll be shared, you'll be spread among the other airline, industry, uh, airline stocks. It, it does not reduce risk very much. But combining the airline and the oil stocks reduced risk from 0.134 to 0.051 since they tended to move in the opposite directions. So to find the volatility of a portfolio, one must know the degree to which the stocks returns move together. And that's going to take us to the next concept, covariance and correlation. But, but, an, but an acute student may, may ask saying, okay, how, how, do, how do we calculate volatility 12.1% and 5.1% here? If we haven't learned how to calculate the volatility for this portfolio yet, well, 12.1% and 5.1% was calculated based on a portfolio return number. So which means using your, using your knowledge from week 10, if you know how to calculate volatility based on returns, you can think about this portfolio as a single stock, right? So that means 12.1% can be calculated by using the uh, standard deviation or the variance formula based on these five numbers, 15%, 25.5, 7%, minus 3.5, minus 3.5, 19.5. I mean, six numbers. So, but now we're, we're gonna learn a little bit more efficiently uh, to calculate uh, vol uh, portfolio volatility if we know the, um, the, the individual volatility for individual stocks, as well as the covariance correlation between the stock. All right. So that takes us to the next concept, covariance and correlation. So I would say this is the background knowledge. Um, I don't think I'm gonna. I don't think I'm gonna ask you a question on on, on calculating a covariance of two stocks. Most likely, you'll be provided because that that calculation can be quite tedious. So covariance is expected product of the deviation of two returns from their means. So the covariance between returns RI and RJ for two different stock I and J is calculated in such way. Uh, you see the first equation and it's important for you to know that the covariance of ri and rj is the same as the covariance of rj and ri we can estimate of the covariance from historical data the first lot of equations based on if you know the distribution but if you do not know the distribution you can also calculate estimate of covariance estimating covariance using the historical data based on the realized data which according to this equation in the yellow box over here um, 
So a take takeaway message over here is that, well, the covariance, just like variance, is a, is a rather strange number because it's, it's some, you can think about it's being squared. It's like return minus return times return minus return. So it's like a square turn. But what we can get out of it is that if the covariance is positive, the two returns tend to move together. And if the, if the covariance is negative, the two returns tend to move in opposite directions. And when if i equals to j, then the covariance, which means you want to find a covariance of stock with itself, that just becomes variance. All right. And given and because just like when people say I don't I don't want to deal with variance because the return is being squared, I want to deal with standard deviation because that's squared of variance. There's a there's an equivalent term in the context of covariance, and that term is. Uh, well, again, again, that is just that that is invented. It's called correlation. It's a measure of the common risk shared by stocks that does not depend on their volatility. So, to calculate co correlation, it's equals to the covariance of R and R J divided by the standard deviation of I times standard deviation of R J, right? And rearrange the formula, you can get another way to calculate covariance if you know the correlation. If you know the standard deviation of the two stocks, all right, and the correlation between two stocks would always be between bounded between minus one and plus one. So unlike covariance can be negative, positive can be negative, positive and zero, and the magnitude can go can go. I would say I wouldn't say infinite, right? But correlation here is bounded between minus one and one, which is probably why people prefer analyzing correlation because when when correlation is equals to one, it tells you that these two items, i and j, perfectly positive correlated. Which means, if you go down by 10%, I will go down by 10% exactly. If you go down by 10%, I will go down by 10% exactly. And when it's zero, it means uncorrelated. It means you can go up and down. I'm not going to move alongside with you, right? And a perfectly negative correlated at minus one, means that if you go down by 10%, I will go up by 10% exactly. And if you go down by 10 go up by 10%, I'll go down by 10%, right? Means that we went perfectly negatively correlated. So this is some background knowledge, such that if we learn uh, such that, that give, uh, give us some sort of like quantification, we will try to say how to, ha you know, what's the better way to, to form portfolio, portfolio theory, right? So, okay, um, so, Again, this I, I would say this line is important for you to just read it through. You can you can try to follow up what they're doing and reproduce a few numbers, but my you know my but I think the my emphasis wouldn't be on wouldn't be on saying you know you have to reproduce this table like in exam right for example because it's just very tedious to calculate covariance and it can be done very efficiently within Excel then why don't we just use Excel to do it or many other statistic type program but it's important for you to know how, how to do it so here let's just say um, let's just say we calculate the co covariance of North Air and West Air and we calculate the covariance between West and Tax Oil and we calculate the correlation and we find out the correlation between North Air and West Air is 0 0.624 and the correlation between West Air and Tex Oil is minus 0.713. So you can you can think about be, uh, these two pairs. One one of them will be sitting on this end. They tend to move together, the North Air and West Air. But West Air and Tex Oil will be on the left hand side. That tend to move ops oppositely, right? So you can see that we're, we're getting somewhere, right? We're getting somewhere. So you can so you can think about uh, that's probably one of the reasons. Why, sorry. So you can think about that's one of the reasons why here when, when you form up the portfolio, you can think about why the second portfolio has a lower volatility than the first one. It's because the West Air and Tax Oil tend to move in the opposite direction. So which means that give you a hint is to form a portfolio by choosing stocks that do not co-move together, right? Like it gives you, a, it gives you a vague idea. We, we're getting there, right? We're getting there. All right. So let's look at some historical annual volatilities and correlation for selected stock. Let's say here we have, um, we here we have Microsoft, Dow, 
Another airline company, Southwest Airlines, Ford Motor, General Motors, uh, General Mills. And you can think about here, uh, the correlation of Microsoft with Dell is highly correlated, 62%. Not surprising that same industry, IT industry. But the correlation between Microsoft and, you know, and Southwest Airlines is relatively low, 0.23. And it's quite interesting for, for anyone to point out that, you know, um, none of the correlation, none of the correlation is negative, right? So the, the top panel is on 1996 to 2008. The bottom panel is between 1996 to 2011, right? None of them is, is none of them is negative, so which means that it's, it's very difficult for you to find two stocks that do, that that do not co-move together. They will always co-move by a common factor of the market. But you can think about where Dell and General Mills, they the correlation is 0 0.07, right? This number 0 0.07. That means that they tend to be they tend to be not moving together, which means when you think about forming a portfolio, maybe picking Dell and General Mills would be a good idea, right? That's just our intuition. We'll get to that. All right, so another background knowledge. So if you want to compute portfolio variance when n equals to two, so to measure portfolio variance, we could form the portfolio and compute the, uh, the variance. So using these formulas, alternatively, like what we did before, we can then we can calculate the, the return of the portfolio. We can then calculate variance based on the portfolio return. There are two ways. But so so over here, let's just say if we know the standard deviation of the individual stock one and two, and if we know the correlation between one, and two, then we can calculate the uh, calculate the portfolio variance using these formulas, which is um, W one square means the weight of the first stock squared times the variance of the first stock plus the weight of the second stock squared times the variance of the stock two plus two times weight one, weight two times the correlation times standard deviation times standard deviation of R2. So some of you may know that, well, this turns over here, correlation times standard deviation times standard deviation is the same as covariance, right? Because that's just how we define it, right? That's same as covariance. If you rearrange the formula, you get covariance equals to correlation times two standard deviations, right? So which means we can cal we can calculate we can now calculate our portfolio of West Air and and, and um, tax oil from the uh, from the previous slide. We can we can this is you know this is just trying to, trying to say this, this is another way to calculate variance this is probably the preferred way for many people to calculate variance because it's a lot likely for you to get individual stock return information individual um, individual standard deviation information and then estimating a correlation between different stocks and based on these stocks you can think about what kind of portfolios can I form all right so that's why people prefer to calculate variance in that way right Uh, just another background knowledge. So the volatility of a very large portfolio. So the variance of the portfolio is equal to the weighted average covariance of each stock with the portfolio. So the variance RP equals to just the weighted average of co uh, of covariance. Um, and so so let's say if you struggle to, to see how this formula VRP equals to XI times XJ times covariance RIRJ, how that can be linked to to this formula over here, just remember when R I and R J, I and J, if I and J both equals to one, the covariance of one and one becomes just the variance, right? So that's just the variance term of two weight, variance term of two weight times two times weight times weight times covariance, right? So those two those two formulas are kind of equivalent. But you can think about that that the variance just reduced to the covariance over here of different stocks. And and it's just so in so in real life we don't actually use your pen and paper to calculate that because if you have two stocks there are four items for you to calculate two variance to two covariance and in terms of calcs calculation is three because the variance two variance and two covariance is the same so you you need to do three times of 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 calculation. And when you have 10 stocks, that kind of becomes sort of unmanageable, right? So, you know, it's, this is best to use a statistic software like R, which is free. You can, you can use R or, or anything else to calculate, to calculate the, um, 
the the uh, the portfolio covariance when you have more than two stocks, right? So it's just trying to show you that you know uh, it's a lot easier to, do, to use a computer to do it rather than using pen and paper, which is probably why I, I'm not a big fan of testing your ability to test this because there's no point because I can't do it. I, you know, when you have four stocks, I probably lose track. All right, so when we're trying to say diversification, so we can diversify with an equally weighted portfolio of many stocks. So if you have an equally weighted portfolio, a portfolio in which the same amount is invested in each stock, then we can calculate the variance of an equally weighted portfolio of n stocks. So it's, again, this is just, I will say this is background knowledge as well. It's something that for you to take away, it's more important to understanding the, the idea behind it and what's the takeaway message rather than saying how to calculate it. So the variance of RP, variance of the portfolio, if you have n stocks, becomes one times n times average variance of the individual stocks, plus one minus one over n times average covariance between the stocks. And when n gets really, really big, what happened to one over n? So which means when you're holding a portfolio, equally weighted portfolio of say, a thousand stocks, 500 stocks, when this n becomes really big, it just means one over n will become really, really small. And when n becomes infinitely big, then one over n approaching zero. So which means the variance of RP will be approaching one minus, so one over n that just becomes zero because that's approaching zero. And that means one minus one over n will become approaching one. So which means the variance of the portfolio will approaching the average covariance between the stocks. So here, uh, you know, using this graph as, as an illustration that shows you that the, the more stocks you are holding, your portfolio volatility, if it's weakly weighted, the, the portfolio of volatility will, 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 we're gonna go down to a level and that level correspond to the average covariance between each stocks, right? So here is an example, um, diversification using different types of stocks. Stock within a, single industry tend to have a higher correlation than stocks in different industries. And likewise, stocks in different countries have lower correlation on average than stocks within the United States. So for example, you can think about, um, let's say if you're investing two stocks, one stock in UK, one stock in China, right? It's, un it's unlikely that, that they will, you know, the, the correlation of them will be a lot smaller than if you're picking any two stocks in UK and any two stocks in China, right? So here is a numerical example. What's the volatility of a very large portfolio of stocks within an industry in which the stocks have a volatility of 40% and a correlation of 60%? And what is the volatility of a very large portfolio of international stocks with a volatility of 40% and a correlation of 10%? So here, just to give you an idea. So we're saying when it's a very large portfolio, that just means that the, the, the portfolio variance was just gonna be approaching the average covariance. And the average covariance equals to the correlation times the individual um, times the individual um, volatility, which in this case forty percent and forty percent. So you can see that here the average covariance for this for the first portfolio will be thirty one percent, and this is a lot higher than the average covariance square of average co covariance of um, of the international stock twelve point six percent. So here you can achieve superior diversification using international stocks. Why? It's because the average correlation is a lot lower, right? That gives you that gives you another idea of saying when you do diversification, of course you want to go abroad, you want to go to a different market, and you want to go to different investing in different asset type. Because by investing in different country, different asset class, like if you shouldn't just put all your money in equity, you should put some of the money in the um, real estate in bonds. And in different market, like you know, you can buy buy a raise buy real estate in Shanghai or buy real estate in Singapore and and selling some bonds in uh, so buying some bonds in US, for example. And and in that case, you can achieve a much lower correlation because those those three items tend not to co move together, right? But what if you have an unequally weighted portfolio? So again, all these are very abstract to you, but we just want, want to get the message out of that is that uh, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter whether it's equally weighted or not, or unequally weighted. What, what matters later is, is, is that the, the diversification will reduce the, uh, the variance. 
So here, let's say for a portfolio with arbitrary, arbitrary weight, the standard deviation, which is the square root of variance, is calculated as a summation of the amount that held in one of one uh, in a particular stock times the standard deviation of stock I times the correlation or with the stock of I with uh, the uh, the portfolio return. So see how this one is this 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 formula is slightly different from how this one over here because that is average variance of the individual stocks and covariance between the stocks, but this one is to do with the individual stock times their contribution to the risk that is common to the portfolio, right? So um, so you don't have to go through like a derivation to to prove this formula, but what we want to show over here is that. So unless all of the stocks in the portfolio have a perfect positive correlation of plus one with one another, then the risk, so let's just say unless that's the case, otherwise the risk of the portfolio would be lower than the weighted average volatility of individual stocks. So which means the, the volatility of the stock of the portfolio RP equals to what we've shown over here, XI times SDRI times correlation of RIP should be less than individual weight times SDRI which is because the correlation is bounded between minus one to one. So unless it's one for every single pair, otherwise, otherwise it's always better to combine them than think about, than just than simply think about its weighted average of the individual stocks, uh, volatility, all right? So summary so far, the lower the correlation between stocks the greater the potential risk reduction from diversification. And we learned that, you know, uh, from last week, unsystematic risk or firm-specific risk, which is uncorrelated across firms, can be largely eliminated. But systematic risk, which is common to all stocks, cannot be eliminated. So we have some ad hoc rules for diversification. We should pick many stocks. We should uh, they come from unrelated industries, countries, invest equally, all right? Because if you, don't, if you have no idea what we're doing, then you should invest equally, such that you can achieve, you can achieve in, a, in terms of mathematically that the, the portfolio variance will, will approach the, uh, the, the, um, the, the covariance, the average covariance between stocks, all right? This is, the, this is the summary so far. But then we're gonna go on to, to say, go one step further to say, now we're gonna define efficient portfolio and let's see how we can arrive an efficient portfolio. So if we re know return, volatility and correlation, and how can we decide what percentage, what way to invest in which stocks? I, is one combination of XIs better in some ways than other combinations? Remember risk averse investors means that holding the same return Risk averse investor prefer to have low risk, and risk neutral investor prefer is is neutral to different risk as long as the return is the same. But where risk seeking investor will prefer the return that is uh, same return same same expected return, but prefers a lot higher risk, right? And in economics so far, we have assumed that investors are risk averse which is probably a not so unreasonable assumption, but as you will learn in the third year finance unit, that you take, uh, Kamen and Tavers keep on that people are not always risk averse. People are only risk averse when they making money and people become risk seeking when they lose money. And they call that prospect theory and that, that framework has won Daniel Kahneman a Nobel Prize but not uh, Tversky because he passed away before that. All right, so remember risk versus investors wish to maximize return for a given level of risk, they want to invest in an, in an efficient portfolio. So, so again here, what do you mean by efficient portfolio? Efficient portfolio means that there's no way to reduce the volatility of the portfolio without lowering its expected return. Right, we introduced that, lot, introduced that, that term last week. But this week we're gonna examine it in details. So, which means in an on if in an inefficient portfolio, it is possible to find another portfolio that is better in terms of both expected return and volatility. 
All right, let's again start with a N equals two, two, two different stocks. Let's, let's, let's consider the portfolio of Intel and Coca-Cola. So here, expected returns and volatility for different portfolios of two stocks. So here, uh, we have different weight of I. So you can see that uh, an XI rep represents the weight in Intel, XC represents the weight in Coca-Cola. So in the first scenario where we allocate 100% of wealth in Intel, 0% in, Co in Coca-Cola, we get an expected return of the portfolio, which really just, just means the Intel. It's 26% and volatility 50%. And then if you have 80% in I and 20% in C, using the formulas that we, we did earlier, we can calculate expected return of the portfolio being 22% and volatility being 40.3%, right? Um, and then so on, so on, that, and, and that's that. That just means on a different weight scenario, different allocation, here is a return for your portfolio, the corresponding portfolio, and the volatility for the corresponding portfolio. And that's, how about we plot that? If we plot that, so going from say zero and one, so going from 100% in Coca-Cola, 0% in Intel, to about 0.2 and 0.8 allocation to about 100% in Intel and 0% in Coca-Cola. So that's just really, we're plotting the numbers we, we, we used over here, right? So that just, those six dots is corresponding to the, um, to this six pairs of information, given that we're plotting X, uh, we're plotting return on Y axis and volatility on X axis. So here you can see that this blue segment over here is the inefficient portfolio. Why? It's because you can achieve, so comparing to 100% allocated in Coca-Cola, you can achieve a better outcome by investing 40% in Intel and 60% in Coca-Cola because they give you roughly similar volatility of the stock but give you a lot higher return. Right, so that's why you can see, think about over here, this segment over here, they are inefficient. But we're in this, along this red line over here, we call that efficient portfolios. Because given on what you have with Intel and Coca-Cola, you really cannot get any better outcome than what's over here, right? Let me repeat that again. So this blue line over here is the in, represented the inefficient portfolios, so which means the weight between zero to 20% in Intel and the weight between 80% to 100% in Coca-Cola, those portfolio will be, relatively speaking, inefficient uh, comparing to these red lines over here because you could do better by lowering, uh, by, uh, by lowering your volatility or keeping the same volatility by having a high return. But when you come to the efficient portfolio on the, uh, over here, you can see that there really isn't a better, like a way for you to to say all right can i achieve a better outcome than this point can i achieve a better outcome in terms of re maintain the same volatility but higher return can you do that no i can't the only way possible way for me to do it is to say i have to take a little bit more risk i have to bear more volatility in order to in order to gain the increasing return if you understand that, that makes sense for you to go back to revisit to your your definition, which is in, in an efficient portfolio, there is no way to reduce the volatility of the portfolio without lowering its expected return, right? So which means the only way for the gain return is to taking more risk, taking more volatility over here, all right? So why can ER increase and risk decrease? So in this case, why can you why can you why can you observe such cases where can you you can actually increase return but reducing the volatility? How, why why would that happen? So why would that happen between like amount if going from the blue line to the red line? So this example with Intel and Coca Cola show you that by you know by varying different allocation way to either Intel or a or Coca-Cola, you can achieve a more efficient portfolio than, than the otherwise. But recall the example that we saw earlier in today's slide between West Oil and Tex versus uh, North, Air, North Air and West Air, and then West Air and Tex Oil. How can ER increase and risk decrease? 
So how can we resemble that kind of scenario? So correlation has no effect on the expected return of portfolio, but the volatility of the portfolio will differ depending on the correlation. And the lower the correlation, the lower the volatility we can obtain. And as the correlation decreases, the volatility of the portfolio falls. So we, so in this example, in the in the previous example over here, we haven't really told you what the correlation between um, Intel and Coca-Cola is. And in fact, what we're gonna do now is to give you very, uh, you know, very different outcomes. Let's just say, you know, we're gonna vary the correlation between Intel and Coca-Cola, and then and to see uh, what, what you know what kind of um, scenario would that show you. And the, our goal is to show you that the lower the correlation between uh, the lower the correlation, the bigger the gain from diversification. All right. And again, here it means the same risk, but higher return. So let's just say we we uh, vary of the correlation between Intel and Coca-Cola between plus one and minus one. So let's just say over here, if it's plus one, that means the same thing. Really, the Coca-Cola and Intel are the same thing. Then you can think about that you really can't achieve any better outcomes. So all your portfolios between Intel and Coca-Cola are efficient, right? You know, are efficient per se because in this case, really, by doing diversification, you can't really achieve a more efficient outcome. But let's just say as soon as the correlation is not plus one, it becomes a smaller number than plus one. You can see that towards minus one, you can think about over here. Let's just say pick any point. You can think about for for a given um, for a given return, you see a lower portfolio volatility, and that's is a result of a lower correlation, right? If you're comparing this point over here when the correlation is plus one to say this point on the blue line over here, the correlation is minus one. You can think about on every single point, single uh, portfolio allocation, that you can achieve a better outcome by um, by lowering the volatility given the same expected return. And of course, let's just say when correlation is minus one, everything over here, this blue line over here going from here to here are uh, inefficient because you can achieve a better outcome by 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 going on to the efficient portfolio from here to here because in every in every case that you, you can have better return on this point than this point holding the uh, the same with the same volatility you can achieve a better ex expected return but what this graph here illustrates that that's the benefit of diversification and that comes from the lower correlation so which means when you're trying to form a two like a you know like a pair of two stocks let's say if you want to form a portfolio based on two stocks your goal here will be to say i want to you know i want to find two stocks that 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 couldn't be more negatively correlated with each other in this case the lower correlation the bigger the reduction in, in terms of in terms of risk and that is what it's trying to it's trying to go through over here. The lower the correlation, the bigger the gain from diversification. And the gain here is the same risk with high return. And this is the first goal. This is the first step for us to say how do we quantify the benefit of diversification? And such that such benefit comes from the lowering the correlation, right? And the correlation is only possible when you have portfolio because otherwise, if you just have single stock that would always be correlated by with itself right so which means i'm buying so let's say if my goal is to, to uh, i can buy 100 bhp shares so you can, i can think about 100 bhp shares like 50 bhp shares and 50 bhp shares which means you're not doing diversification because that 50 bhp shares is always 100 correlated with the other 50 bhp shares right and you can achieve a better outcome in terms of diversification even if you if you're gonna diversify with real team tool because they, they're not gonna be 100% correlated. So can the weight XI be less than zero? Yeah, we talked about it at the start of the lecture, yes. The, the positive investment in a security means it is a long position. If the weight is negative, it means a short position. So in a short sale, you sell a stock that you do not own now and then buy the stock back in the future. And short selling is advantages strategy if you expect a stock price to decline in the future to mask the opposite to what you would do in a long position if you're holding a long position in a stock what well, your goal here is to say the return will be higher in the future with the short stock price will go up and now that's why you buy it and if you don't and if you see, if you believe the opposite is going to happen the stock price is going to plunge you will short it right so the wake xi here can be negative um let's just say if if, if the weight can be negative then 
given an arbitrary correlation between Intel and Coca-Cola, and we can extend our portfolio line. So which means you can invest more, you can short Intel, means you short sell Intel with a, with a, with a more money you get from, with the amount of money you get from short selling Intel, you can buy more Coca-Cola. So which means that you can go further down this line, but of course it's not, it's not recommended in, given this scenario because everywhere over here in the blue line, they're inefficient means you can do better by you can get higher return with the same volatility or higher return with low volatility by going on a red line. And over here on red line here, you can extend this point by shorting Coca-Cola. The extra money you have, you can long Intel, all right? All right. So let's just say we're going to introduce a third stock called Ball, Ball Stock. Right, just another company, Ball Stock, and we want to we want to show you, right? Given the two stocks that we had before, Intel and Coca Cola, given is let's say with an arbitrary uh, correlation, we we produce this this if, this frontier over here. But let's just say we we're, we're gonna give you a third company, uh, company called Ball, and in terms of, in terms of return, it's lower than Coca Cola, in terms of volatility, it's the same as Coca Cola, roughly the same. So you would say, okay, w w in this in this case. Having the third stock in this case, would that actually improve the outcome? I know you tend to think that, well, given that the ball has, has the same volatility and lower return than Coca-Cola, no one's going to invest in that stock because, you know, why would anyone want to invest in a stock that has similar risk level but same return? But remember, we can't actually use volatility to proxy for risk when it comes to individual stock. It's the beta that proxy the, the, the stock, uh, stock risk. So in this case, um, let's just say here, I mean, we're not going to show you all the numbers, but show you all, all, like all the possible numbers. Let's just say over here, um, get, again, with an, with an arbitrary correlation between Ball and Coca-Cola and Ball and Intel, even though Ball looks like everywhere inferior to Coca-Cola, but having Ball as the third choice, you can now, if you, you can now form a portfolio of three stocks, including short sales. So what we're gonna have, what you see over here is that you can see that your efficient frontier, which is the which is the curve, that red curve over here, that represents all the efficient portfolios that is available from investing Intel, Coca Cola, and Boy at the same time. You can see that that's being pushed towards northwest. You're going from the blue line over here to the red line over there, and you can see that. Let's just say pick a point over here, this point and that point. You can pick pick these two points. Let's just say I mean I really can't draw in front of you. I can't, I can't draw and demonstrate that. But let's just say imagine those two points. You can think about here for those two points. Actually, why, why not let me let, let, let me see what see what I can just take a screenshot. Oh yeah, I can take a screenshot. All right, let's just see what 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 I can draw something out of it. All right, let's say pick a green color. Let's just say, all right, so if you pick this two, two point over here, right, this, so this one, this one is a combination of Intel and Coca-Cola, and this one is a combination of Intel, Coca-Cola, and Bohr in, through some, of, some, of, some sort of weight com combination. You can see that now you had have, you have similar uh, expected return, but your volatility has dropped. And this is the magic of diversification, and this is the magic of correlations between Core and Coca-Cola and Core and, and Bohr and Intel, such that even though Bohr looks like everywhere inferior to Coca-Cola, but because of it, because it doesn't really always co-move with Coca-Cola and Intel, having a third option can push your efficient frontier towards um, towards northwest, and that just means you can have more benefit coming out of coming out from the, from diversification. Which means you can you can lower your risk even more. So you, so you can imagine. So you can imagine what you know. What if you have four stocks, fifth stocks, uh, and then and six stocks, right? So so we, which means that if let's say if we have ten stocks, so rather than just focus on you know um, on IBM, Coca Cola, let's just say we introduce all these other stocks over here based on the, the historical information. So you can think about okay. So this red dash line is a again is a uh, is a efficient frontier with Exxon Mobil, GE, and IBM. But if you have ten stocks, you can see that now that's being pushed towards 
northwest. All right. So push towards northwest means having more stocks will get will move your efficient frontier towards northwest. Why northwest is better? Because the more northwest it is, the lower the higher the return, the lower the volatility. That's what you want to achieve, right? It, it, don't, don't, don't you want to have a low risk and high return? And, that, and that's the case, right? So which means, in this case, that means with all the available stocks, you can keep pushing. So that means if you, let's say, if you have 10 stocks and if you're going to form a portfolio with 10 stocks through, through various different combinations, right? Because each dot, each dot over here represents a particular weight in a particular company. And you are not required to know how to actually reconstruct how, how to construct this efficient frontier but i believe in uh in valuation unit in second year or third year that you are required to reproduce this efficient frontier right reproduce them such that you are able to, to, to draw this line but let's just say for now let's just focus on the point here is that the more stocks that you have underlying your portfolio the more chance that you are be able to push the northwest such that with the same return you can achieve a lower lower risk all right um delete screenshot all right and of course, you shouldn't limit yourself with just 10 stocks. How about 12? How about 15? How about all the 500 companies that in the top 500 companies in the US or top 200 companies in Australia? Or how about extend that to cover both, you know, you know uh, co companies listing both Australia and the US, right? You can, you can, you can, you can do that. Um, so, all right. So now we're going to introduce a, um, like a very important concept is to adding the risk-free asset to the set. So this is, this, uh, this, from this way, it will take you to the original derivation of CAPM. And in a different version of CAPM, which is uh, actually extended by Fisher Black, which you, know, you may recall early, early on, I saying Fisher Black has another paper on, published in 1973, which leads to Black Shell's model, which is one of the best known uh, you know, uh, model in finance. He has many other contributions, and one of them was to extend KPM into, into, into a version that without risk-free asset. But anyway, but let's just say here, uh, we, let, you know, what would happen if we're adding the risk-free asset to the set? So consider an arbitrary risky portfolio and the effect on risk and return or putting a fraction of the money in the portfolio while leaving the remaining fraction in risk-free attributes. And this is non-trivial. So let's just say if I'm gonna leave some part of it in a risk-free asset. So in this case, the expected return of the overall portfolio that X being allocated to this risky portfolio will be, okay, one X represents the weight, so which means one minus X is the weight allocated to risk-free asset. And the X is allocated to the, um, the uh, the, the risky portfolio, excuse me, risky portfolio. So which means overall, so the the, the uh, so overall, if you break the bracket, you get the expected rate return of your portfolio equals to RF plus X times ERP minus IF, right? And in a levered portfolio, which means you buy on margin, X of course can be one, can be greater than one, and which means that you're borrowing to buy more risky asset. And so, what, so what does that do? Which means, let's just say, let's just say here, uh, imagine this is the portfolio. This is so this blue line, and the red line is your existing portfolio, risky portfolio, all the all, all the possible outcomes. Where the blue line, blue segment represent the the inefficient area, and the blue and red line here represent the efficient area. And this, in, and in this case, let's just say if I pick any point P, right? If I pick any point P here, I just say, because if I keep going up along the red line, I then have to take more risk if I want to have high, high return. But let's just say for now, let's pick any point P. And if I pick any point P here, then I can invest. Um, and then and would, would now the availability of risk-free investment, I can allocate, I can invest some of that in, um, in the risk-free asset some of it in the risky portfolio. And I can even extend that line to go over here because I can buy a P on margin, which means I borrow to buy, right? I borrow to buy. But of course, so the, if the, the impact of that is, let me take a screenshot again. The impact, the impact of that is, remember originally, 
originally this is your efficient portfolio right this is your efficient portfolio if you don't have the risk-free asset so that's the efficient portfolio available with um with all the risky asset right but what's happening now with a combination like with the possibility of investing in a risk-free investment is that it actually extends your efficient frontier to cover this area so which means now if you let's just say if someone who say I want to, is that possible for me to invest in a portfolio which gives me 6% um, volatility, right? 6% volatility. And then some people will say, okay, well, that is not possible if it's, if it, if it's just looking at over here, right? That's not possible because, um, if I can't see the number, that, uh, I mean, that's not possible because the lowest volatility you can, you can get will be roughly 8%. But now with the possibility of investing in risk-free asset you can then to say okay i can invest some of that in risk-free asset and some of it in my existing risky portfolio such that i can actually take a lower return but at the same time that gives me lower volatility so which means by by you know so which means by investing in risk-free investment that really extend your efficient portfolio such that the overall efficient portfolio is no longer a curve, it becomes a line and a curve, right? Hopefully that, that's clear for you now. But it shouldn't stop, it shouldn't stop as just there. Why? Because we just randomly pick a point P. So, which means, oh, sorry. Um, we're going to come back to, to, to cover that point, but now now just very, one very quickly to show you how do we calculate standard deviation of the portfolio. So, so the standard deviation of the portfolio with now allocating part of that in risk-free asset is a very, very important, we're using a very, very important properties of risk-free asset, which is, remember the, the, um, the calculation of that equals to the weight in risk-free asset square, weight square times variance of risk-free asset plus weight square times variance of RP plus two times one minus weight plus times weight times covariance of risk-free asset and RP. So here, a very important feature of risk-free asset is that, well, it's risk-free, so which means it doesn't move. So which means the variance of it, because given it's risk-free, there's no risk, such that the variance of that is zero. And the other one is that given it's risk-free, it's not determined by anything, which means that it's not it's not going to co-move with anything else, such that the covariance is always is also zero. So, which means the the variance of the portfolio is just reduced to the weight you invest in in um in the risky asset times variance of the risky asset, which means the x times SDRP for the volatility. So, which means the way how you interpret this is that a standard deviation is only going to be a fraction a linear fraction of the volatility of the risky portfolio based on the amount invested in the risk risky portfolio which is why you can which is why this one becomes a straight line right because that's going to be a linear function linear function of your volatility in p and the weight you invest in um, in a risk free asset So to earn the highest possible expected return for any level of volatility, we must find a portfolio that generates the steepest possible align when combined with a risk-free investment. And um, so, and then, then, then now let's go back to uh, okay. Let's now let's go back to this line. Oh, sorry. Let's, now let's go to this line over here. So remember that we, we were saying. Um, let's help us just take a screenshot. All right. So re remember we were saying that. Let's just say if we pick a random random point P over here, we can with the risk-free investment, we can now create part of the efficient frontier over here, and then the remaining efficient frontier along this efficient frontier curve over here, right? But that P really is just arbitrary, right? Um. By the way, someone may ask saying, why don't I invest over here? Well, you wouldn't want to invest over here because it's better off for you to go over here, right? Better off for you to go over here. Because because uh, on, along the red line over there, it offers you high return for the same amount of volatility, right? But really, that was just a, an arbitrary line. 
So let's just say I can draw many lines. I can, let's say I can pick another P over here. I can pick another P over here. If we pick another P over here, then what we're gonna have is that, oh, okay, let's just see what, see what I can draw. Okay. All right, I have, I, have some, I have some sort of confidence on using that. All right, so let's just say if I draw another P over here, if I join another, if I pick another P, P2 over here, right? You can see that now with the P2, again, that P2 is just a random point on, on, on my existing portfolio. If I pick that P2, I can say that that P2 resolve a better outcome than what I have of P1 before, right? Sorry, why? Because if you compare that red line over here with the with the blue line, I don't know whether that's blue. Uh, you can call that blue. Whoops. Um, you can see that everywhere is better than before, and of course that you will share the same you know efficient front efficient frontier over here, right? But again, that P two is just arbitrary. We can just say, okay, when will be the best outcome such that I can get the highest. So I, you can see if I just pick a P over over there, if I pick the P along the line, then I'm able to produce a better outcome. So let's just say if I pick a P over here, I can draw another line across across it. If I pick a P over here, I can then I can draw another line as well, and um, I can draw another line as well. Right? I, I'm not going to draw it, but you can imagine there's a line there. But in what, which line, which point would that give me the best outcome? So in this case, the green line here is introduced. The green line here is called a tangent portfolio. It's a line that will combine the risk-free investment and a particular portfolio P here. Portfolio P here such that, such that it's just touching the previous efficient frontier but it's everywhere better than my efficient frontier. But remember, you have to touch it because let's just say, can I invest in, in, in this line over here? Let's just say, imagine, oh, let, let me just change the weight. Let's just say, okay, let's just say, can I, uh, I'm just randomly draw one, bear with me. Okay, let's just call it yellow. Oh, I don't know why is that green again. Let's just, okay, green, green. Okay. okay, why don't I just invest? Why don't I just invest along this line? Why not? Why not invest in this long line over here? Well, because that's not possible. Why? Because it's not because you you, you are investing in risk free investment, but with your existing stocks over here, with the existing stocks over here, and with the efficient frontier they are forming over there, you are not possible to, to you are not possible to create that 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 that, that, that kind of portfolio. It's just not available given the, the amount of instrument that you have over there. So which means that I can go, you know, if, if, if I want, let's say, uh, on, a, you know, on a theoretical sense that I can even invest along this line. Why not? Why, 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 why not to be greedy and just to say, I'm gonna get all the return and no risk. But is that possible? That, that, that's not possible like with all the, you know, with all the, uh, with, with all the stocks that you see over here. Remember that your portfolio is formed based on the, based on the given inst instrument, given, given equities in the market. But none of that, but those stocks over here form this efficient frontier and it's only possible for you to form a portfolio if, it's, if, it's, if it has to involve that portfolio over there. So which means this line is not possible this line is not possible and those lines over here let's just draw another red uh, yellow one as just to f for the sake of discussion and this line is possible but as you can see is not as efficient as that green line right so that green line here is the tangent or efficient portfolio so which means that 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 um so that tangent portfolio is the best outcome that you can achieve. So what, what is the slope for this green line, right? Let's just get rid of everything else such that, oops. Let's just get rid of everything else such that you make it clear before we to analyze the green line. All right. You know, this is actually my first time using these tools in, um, in, in on my iPad. 
So how do we measure the slope of it? You know, if you don't have an iPad, I really seriously recommend you should, you should consider buying one because it's such a, such, such a useful tool. Um, so the slope of this line, slope of this line, or the slope of this line equals to rise over run. And a rise equals to what? Rise equals to this area, this area. Actually, why don't we just use this area, this blue area. And that equals to your portfolio return over here minus risk-free return. That's your rise. And what's your run? This is your run. This is your run, right? Rise over run. And that's to how you cal cal calculate the slope, right? And, th and the run would be portfolio return. And this is known as sharp ratio. Right, let's just, now let's go back to the, to the lecture slide. So here, to earn the highest possible expected return for any level of volatility, we must find a portfolio that generates the steepest possible line when combined with a risk-free investment. So here, the sharp ratio really is just the slope of the line matches the ratio of reward to volatility provided by a portfolio. And sharp ratio here, as we saw, it was just the expected return of the portfolio minus risk-free divided by the standard deviation of RP. That's just rise over run, right? And another way of, of, of seeing it, that just means the portfolio access return over portfolio volatility. Why I call it sharp ratio? Because it's invented by William Sharp, right? The portfolio with the highest sharp ratio is the portfolio with a line with risk-free investment is tangent to the efficient frontier of risky investment. The portfolio that generates this tangent line is known as the tangent portfolio. So if you're not sure what this concept are, and I really encourage to go back, rewind this video, going back to say 10 minutes ago, to really rewatch that, why, I, why that green line is the, is, the, is the ultimate outcome, is the best outcome, right? It's superior in, in everything else. Right, that, that green line. So, Identifying a tangent portfolio. So combinations of the risk-free asset and the tangent portfolio provide the best risk and return trade-off available to an investor. This means that the tangent portfolio is efficient and that all efficient portfolios are combination of the risk-free investment and the tangent portfolio. So which means here, remember this tangent portfolio is only touching that efficient frontier at one point. At a point where it is, it's just that point. They're not touching that line at, at any other point. You can't have two intersections, right? It's only just touching at, at one point, where every other point relation between risk-free asset and the efficient portfolio, or, and, and that tangent portfolio, RP. Where over here, it means that you're leveraging, which means that you're actually borrowing and to buy more of that tangent portfolio, right? And that's what a green line over here is that everywhere superior to what's, what we had originally on that red line. So every investor should invest in this tangent portfolio because if everyone has this information, if everyone has done finance, I mean, remember, we are, we, are, we are going to derive a model and this is one of the assumptions, right? So let's just say here, let's just say if every investor knows this and everyone has gone through this lecture and they say, okay, and everyone can calculate and can reproduce this efficient portfolio and can do this graph, then that means that it makes sense for them to say they should invest in the tangent portfolio independent of his or her taste for risk. Which means, let's just say, theoretically speaking, if everyone can reproduce this graph, and if everyone understands this, this concept well, they would say, yeah, I agree with you, Frank, or I agree with you, William Sharp, or I agree with you, with, you know, with all these inventors, that I think if I can reproduce this graph, then uh, there's no way for me to invest in any other portfolio other than the green one. Because the green one is everywhere much superior than, than, than anything else, right? R regardless of your taste for risk. Because remember, the definition for the risk uh, seeking means that same risk, sorry, same return, risk seeking people would say, oh, I want high risk. And holding the return constant, everyone would say, you know, um, 
uh, holding a risk, holding a return constant, then I, you know, um, risk risk averse would, would mean that I want lower risk. So in this case, you can see that this green line is every every better because they actually provide a highest highest return, right? You provide a higher highest return on every possible outcome of volatility. So which means an investor's risk preference here will determine only how much to invest in the tangent portfolio versus the risk-free investment. Not to say which, which portfolio they would, they would invest in, they would say they will definitely invest in tangent portfolio as well as risk-free investment, but your risk preference determines what's the fraction allocated to each component, right? And I would say this is a very important con idea for, the, for you to understand. If you're not sure, pause the video, go back again, and to think about why anyone would only want to invest, would only want to invest along this green line. It's very important for you to understand that, right? Uh, we are making a lot of assumptions. I mean, you know, we, ha we are assuming that you can reproduce these graphs. We are assuming that that graph, rep uh, you know, represent what, you know, you know what, what happens in the market. Right, there's no measurement errors, for example. But I just say, if we can reproduce this graph, then we should agree that everyone is gonna invest on a green line. So if all investors would hold same proportion of the same portfolio of risky asset, then that means all, and all risky assets are held by someone, or they don't exist, right? They're gonna be held by held by someone. It follows that this is a very uh, in, um, imp important uh, deduction, is that the tangent portfolio must be the market portfolio. All risky assets are held in proportion to their market capitalization, right? So that means that tangent portfolio, if we, I have all the stocks available to re reproduce this efficient frontier, then that tangent portfolio must be the market portfolio, which is the market portfolio that you allocate according to a particular weight to uh, all the market, all, all the stocks. So which means how to improve a portfolio. So assume that there's a portfolio of risky securities, P. So given, you know, given what we've done so far, let's say how do we improve this portfolio? Assume there's a portfolio of risky securities, P. To determine whether P has the highest possible Sharpe ratio, we consider whether its Sharpe ratio could be raised by adding more of some investment I to the portfolio. And the contribution of the investment I to the volatility of the portfolio depends on the risk that I has in common with the portfolio, which is measured by I's volatility multiplied by its correlation with P. All right, let's just see that in, in, a, uh, in, in this format. So which means, again, if you could uh, give a start to this slide, this is another very important slide. Let's just say, if you were to pur purchase more of investment I by borrowing, let's just say, now I'm thinking about buying into investment I, right? Given what I have with portfolio P, right? And let's say given I, I, I already observed portfolio P. And if I want to buy more of investment I, let's say if it, because, you know, um, because I already made my allocations, which means the only chance for me to buy I is to borrow. Let's say if I want to, if I want to um, purchase more of investment I by borrowing, you would only expect a return of I minus the risk-free return because that's the rate you have to return. You have to you have to repay because you're borrowing. When you are you are paying money back, you have to pay back the, uh, through that RF, right? So which means that if we adding I to the portfolio P will improve our Sharpe ratio if the additional return from investment I, this is the additional return, is bigger. And here this is the incremental volatility from investment I. And and that comes from you know um, an earlier uh, earlier you know, an earlier slide I was talking about the contrib contribution from the new investment. So the incremental volatility from investment I because that is standard deviation of, in of investment I times the correlation of RP. Right. So if you if you if you are curious, that is that we actually did it over here, unequally weighted over here, roughly over here. Right. So. But it's more important for you to get, to get the idea. So, so that means in this case, the incremental volatility from investment I times return per unit of volatility available from portfolio P. So this is the trade-off. So this sharp ratio here measures that for every unit of volatility, this is 
my increase in 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 um in in my return. So it's just like if you think about this graph, this green line over here. What I was doing over here is that it, let's say if I want, let me just take another screenshot. So what that green line over here is doing is saying if I want to move, if I want to say if I'm gonna take more risk, if I'm taking more risk, which means if I'm taking more risk going from say roughly here to here, if I'm taking more risk, then I'm expecting my increasing return to be this, right? To go from here to here, right? So this, so this that, that ratio over here, ERP minus RF over um, sigma I, RP, right? This one, that, 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 that change, change of that, that measures your risk return uh, relationship. And remember this slope is the same because given this is a line, that slope is everywhere the same, right? So which means that there's a trade-off between that. So which means for every unit of risk increase, you expect the sum increase in your, um, in your return. And let's just say here's the increment of volatility from investment I. So which means now if I'm gonna invest in this new stock I, then I know that there's gonna be an increase in my volatility. And given, given, given my existing trade-off of return and volatility, that means I, I would only invest, I would only invest in this stock I if the return I get is greater than this trade-off. And let me say that again. The only chance for me to, re to invest in that return, in that new investment I by borrowing is that I can get a higher return than the increase in risk, which is here, times the return per unit of volatility, which means that is like a, let me just, sorry, let me just take another screenshot to show you. So you can think about roughly, you think, so this is the changing return. So this is the additional return you get, I'm getting should be greater than my changing risk, I'm getting more risk, times the changing return over changing of risk. So this is my existing trade-off. I cancel that out. So which means the only chance for me to do it is that the changing return from this I is bigger than, than what I'm willing to take based on my existing portfolio. Which means I will only do that if you can improve my current outcome. Because otherwise, I can just allocate more to my existing portfolio P from borrowing, right? And that's very important for you to know. Even even let's say even 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 if you don't know how this all this how that's derived, but it's very important for you to understand conceptually that what I was doing over here is that if I, I you know I would only invest in a new investment I if I can get a higher return per risk. So now let's define a beta of portfolio I with portfolio P as this. So the beta of portfolio I with portfolio P is just defined to be this standard deviation of RI times correlation of RRP over standard deviation of RP, which is the same as covariance of RRP over variance of RP. Because if both sides times standard deviation of RP, the bottom becomes variance of RP, the top becomes covariance of R and RP. Right, you can see that I'm going very slow here because it's very important we are, we are jumping really fast actually, but it's very important for you to, to get the intuition behind this, which then leads on, leads on to a Nobel Prize winning you know, a framework. So increasing the amount investing I would increase the sharp ratio of portfolio P if its anticipated return in RI exceeds the required return of RI, which is given by this formula. So RI here equals to RF. If you rearrange the previous formula, RI equals to RF plus beta IMP times ERP minus RF. So, and that gives you the required rate of return of RI, of investment I. So the expected return that is necessary to compensate for the risk investment I will contribute to the portfolio. And you can see that we're getting close to, very close to a formula that we already saw last week. And now let's go on to um, define it more, more formally. So the expected return of a security, ERI, we can just write a shorthand as RA, equals to RF plus beta I with plus the beta of I and efficient portfolio 
times ER efficient portfolio minus RF. And the portfolio is efficient even only if the expected return of every available security equals its required return. So if ERR was greater than the required return, then, uh, then astute investors would buy and the price would go up and lower expected return. If ER was lower, and then it will sell. So the trading will continue until the expected return of each security equals the exact return, required return. And this is what when market reaches equilibrium, right? And now let's go on to you now the CAPM framework. So, uh, oh, sorry, that will be slide 44 of lecture 10, um, roughly. If we recall the CAPM, capital asset pricing model, we first derived in week 10, not in week 11, sorry. I, I forgot to correct that. Investor can buy and sell securities at competitive market prices without incurring taxes and all transaction costs and can borrow and lend at a risk-free interest rate. Uh, so this is all the implicit assumptions that we have been making so far. Investor hold only efficient portfolios of traded securities, portfolios that yield the maximum expected return for a given level of volatility. So again, that's an assumption because, you know, for example, I myself do not hold an efficient portfolio. Um, I haven't even, I'm, I'm not even holding many stocks, right? I'm only holding the stocks that I'm more familiar with. But it's not unreasonable for anyone, someone to say, as a step one, I'm gonna make this assumption, right? And investors have homogeneous expectations. That just means that homogeneous expectations means that, that means that that's the same as opposed to heterogeneous expectations. So that means everyone agree on what a volatility is, on the correlation is, and expect returns of securities is. So which means everyone has the same belief about what's gonna happen in the future, such that they are, they are, such that they will be able to come up with this graph, right? Because if everyone disagree, then you wouldn't be able to come up with the graph. Because that means the graph would be looking very different. So which means everyone agrees and everyone has homogeneous expectations. So hence, if the CAPM assumptions hold, an optimal portfolio is a combination of the risk-free investment and the market portfolio. And when the tangent line goes through the market portfolio, it is, if you can give a star, it is called the capital market line. Capital market line is a line, it's a tangent line that goes through the market portfolio and the risk-free investment. which is, in this case, that will be uh, illustrated as the green line over here. And that green line, the market portfolio, is also the tangent portfolio, because we're saying, you know, in this, in this, in this, when this assumptions hold, everyone will be investing in the market portfolio. And the only difference is that it's different ways allocated to market portfolio depending on the risk preference. Someone will allocate 100% to that, someone would allocate 80% of that, and the other 20% goes to the risk for investment. So here, the green line is the capital market line. And that illustrates a relationship between expected return and volatility for, for portfolio. And now we come back to where we start with in week 10, that in this case, in, on, along the capital market line, we show there is a linear relationship between risk and return, where the risk is measured by the standard deviation and return is just return over here because they are linear, right? So CAPM, market risk and beta. So given an efficient market portfolio, the expected return of an investment is given by, so this is something else, by the security market line, which I will show you the graph for now. So here the EI equals to RF plus the beta of the market. So beta of the I with the market. So the beta is defined as covariance of the I with the market divided by the variance of the market. And that, so the whole term over here, so if you can have a highlight, or if you don't want to use a highlight, you can use something else. So that whole term here is the risk premium for security I. That whole term. Beta I times, beta I of the market times the expected return of the market minus RF. That whole term is a risk premium for security I. And this term over here, the, the term in the middle, ERM, ER market minus RF, that is the market risk premium. Because for market, the beta will be one because you know for every market, the beta is just one to itself. And the beta is defined as, we show over here, is the volatility of I, stock I, that is common with the market. So standard deviation of RI times correlation of RI and market over standard deviation of market equals the covariance of RI and R market 
over variance of our market, right? And now well, that's the official definition for beta to show you how to quantify that term to capture the systematic risk, right? So the capital market line here on the left hand side, it shows that that is the line that goes, from, goes through the risk free investment and the tangent portfolio, which is the market portfolio. And that's the green line, illustrate the relationship between expected return and volatility. And that helps on a portfolio level. On the right hand side, that is, the, so on the right hand side here is a security market line. It's also a straight line, but you have to pay attention that on the y axis is expected return, but on the x axis is beta. So in your own time, please repeat that again. For security market line, the y axis is the same as the capital market line is expected return, but on the x axis is beta. And the security market line here, the purpose is to show a relationship between beta and return. So which means, again, going back to what we did in week 10, we're trying to come up with a relationship between risk and return. So security market, so the capital market line shows you a risk return relationship on a portfolio level, but where for security market line, that illustrates a relationship between risk and return on the individual stock level when the risk is measured by beta. Very important, okay? And the rest is very straightforward, really. I mean, in terms of the numerical question related to these two weeks, it's very straightforward. So let's say here, assume the risk-free return is 5%, and market portfolio has an expected return of 12%, and standard deviation of 44%. ATP, oil and gas has a standard deviation of 68%, and a correlation with the market of 0.91. What is ATP's beta with the market? So using the formula, beta equals the standard deviation times correlation divided by standard deviation of the market. That gives you 0.68, times 0.91 divided by the market standard deviation 0.44, which is 1.41. And under the cap in assumption, what is expected return? So in this case, expected return here, using the cap in formula, the now we, we have derived the formula, all we need to do is just identify the element and plug everything in. Equals to 5% times 1.41 times 12% minus 5%. So in this case, the market portfolio has expected return of 12%, uh, risk free returns 5%, just an extension. So in this case, given the market return, portfolio has return of 12%, risk free is 5%. What is the market risk premium? The market risk premium is 12 minus five, which is 7%, right? And what is the individual stock risk premium? What is the risk premium for, uh, for ATP? That will be 14.87, minus 5%. You can think about that's just really, that's just the excess return over the risk rate. So that would be 9.87% for the risk premium of RA. Okay. So we can do a little bit of extension to think about beta of, of a portfolio. So the beta of a portfolio is the weighted average of the betas of the securities in the portfolio. So you can do the, so you can do this. And um, so, which means that if I, the beta of my, so let's say if I'm holding a three stock portfolio, what is my, what is the beta of my portfolio where it's corresponding to the market? That's how you can calculate it. We have a numerical example over here. Suppose the stock of a 3M company has a beta of 0 0.69 and a beta of, of Hewlett Parker at 1.77. So assuming the risk free interest rate is 5%, back return of the market portfolio is 12%. What is the expected return of a portfolio of 3M? and HP, according to the cap -in. So in this case, let's first of all calculate the, the beta first. So in this case, this, this really just wanna show you that the cap -in also can be extended to a small portfolio as well, right? So in this case, I have 40% allocated to 3M, 60% uh, allocated to Hewlett Packard. The individual beta is 6 0.69 and 1.77 each. So that means your portfolio beta is 1.338. Applying the cap -in formula, you can get the expected return of your portfolio of 3M and HP will be 14.37% according to the cap right? So as an extension, uh, you can think about, you know, you can think about what happened. What happened if the return, what, happened, what, what happens if, if the observed return is say 12%? If the observed return is 12%, what does that mean? That means the return is lower than what was suggested by Capin, right? 
and if CAPM holds, I just say if CAPM is actually real, is accurate, right? If it's accurate, then that means what, what would happen to, to, to this portfolio? To, 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 let's just say, okay, let's just use that example, okay, of, over here. Let's just say for ATP, you calculate the CAPM of, of return is, expected return is 14.87. But what if, but what if ATP's actual return is say 12%? What does that suggest? That just means uh, if CAPM holds, the stock is currently overvalued, right? It's currently overvalued, which means according to the CAPM, people should sell it. And if you sell it, what happened to the stock price? The stock price will drop, right? A stock price will drop to a level there that the future outcome would happen such that the return will be the same as what the CAPM holds. And this is a big assumption according to the CAPM. So on the other hand side, if the ATP's uh, actual return is say 20%, right? If it's 20%, what, what does that mean? That means currently undervalued, right? And that means currently undervalued, and that means more people will buy it. If more people will buy it, if more people will buy it, what would happen? More people buy it, it push the price up such that the, the return would become smaller, and would then would approaching to was suggested by the um, by the by by the CAPM, and and that would just gonna that just but that's based on assumption where CAPM actually holds, right? So, do all the assumptions fully describe investor behavior? We certainly not. So, how accurate is the CAPM? As as I mentioned last week, it's probably not as not even as accurate as flipping a coin less than 50 percent so but then why do we need to learn it no, apart from the fact that you want our prize but it's a common and most common and important model for risk return and everyone knows it so which means that everyone is expected you to to modify that model a little bit to suit your own needs right the extension to this model which is going to be going through in your third year unit investment analysis and there's going to be application to cost of capital in your second year unit finite 2222 corporate financial policy all right, and that's it. That's all the exam material for FINA 1221 Interacting to Finance. I really hope you enjoyed this unit so far. Thank you for staying and thank you for tuning in and good luck.